Of course, you know, history is perhaps one of the most contested areas of, of uh, uh, academic uh, inquiry. And uh, because this, and all this conversation we've been having, it tells you how important history is. Yeah. Because, uh, because it really defines the uh, constitutive elements of a nation. That the reason you see that people constantly talk about the past in those terms that, you know, we want to revive that this is sort of a move towards reclaiming that history. Yeah. But they want to reclaim that history because of the disruption that colonialism uh, created. Dr. Ramari Tabrizi, I want to ask you a question that's rather broad, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How is history treated in the Middle East? Uh, by history, you mean the discipline of history or, or uh, like... Uh, no, let me uh, explain or, this way, if I may, please. So, or the way people relate to their own history. You no, know, the way they relate to their own history. In America, we are more, for example forward-looking, at least we were, perhaps that's changed a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, in many countries, perhaps in the Middle East, they many a times, and for different reasons throughout their history, stresses mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of society, uh, they become wistful for their mm -hmm. uh, real mm -hmm. and mythological glories, like the Persians, right. the Ottomans, the Fatimids, the Abbasid. That's, mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. I meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um uh, the you know the problem with the uh, it's it's true I think for the entire uh, colonized world and it's particularly true for the Middle East that uh, that colonialism disrupted people's relationship with their own history. Colonialism is such a significant watershed moment for uh, people of the Middle East, in Africa, in South America, in East Asia, in South Asia. But here in the Middle East, exactly because of what you said, that, uh, that, that uh, Islam played such a significant role in all the way from like 9th century to 14th century in terms of scientific discoveries, in terms of philosophical discourses, in terms of literature, in terms of, I mean, this idea of like the Islamic Renaissance mm -hmm. that happens in like 11, 12 centuries. Um, and then in 17th, 18th century, there is this kind of rupture in this history that uh, that the reason you see that people constantly talk about the past in those terms that you know we want to revive that this is sort of a move towards reclaiming that history yeah. but they want to reclaim that history because of the disruption that colonialism uh, created this rupture uh, uh, that colonialism created in their own history. So um, I think that makes sense if you if you live in those regions and yeah. to say that I mean you you see the similar thing in Africa. You know, like now we have Afro pessimism and and um, and uh, and uh, and uh, indigenous people, Native Americans, for example. You know, any people around the world that you look at that their histories were disrupted and interrupted by external forces. They desire to reclaim that history before that disruption. Interesting. And, uh, and uh, so it, it doesn't have anything to do because a lot of people attribute that to uh, Islam as a backward looking religion. You know? And they say that, oh, because Islam is backward looking, 
uh, people constantly are thinking about their past. Um, well, it really doesn't have anything to do with Islam because, again, Islam was a very, very forward-looking. And I know, I mean, all religions can be backward-looking or forward-looking. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that, that you know, uh, there's anything distinct about Islam, you know, here. Um, but the, the backward-looking, that sort of claiming or reclaiming the past is something that is coming from, from that colonial um, um, disruption. Without that, we really can't understand why, uh, I mean, if you look at current politics, if you look at the current war in, in Palestine, if you look at you know, the role of the U.S. in the Middle East, if you look at all these things, they all go back to this kind of uh, um, constitutive element of collective historical memory of uh, people in the Middle East, that, uh, that there was a major, major break. There was a uh, um, penetration that basically pushed them off the rail. And, uh, and now they want to sort of push back that train. <laughs> Get on the road back again. on their on, on 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 track, right? Yeah. And and in order to do that, there is violence. <laughs> there, there there are wars. There are you know reclaiming of the past, and and all those things. So I think that the uh, um, uh, the mistake always is that to to sort of uh, search for that kind of reclaiming of the past in the essence of Islam. There's nothing in the essence of Islam to, to um, suggest that. When you say there's nothing in the essence of Islam, it makes me think of other um, examples of trying to reclaim the past. Uh, uh, something that you and I have in common, the Shah of Iran, he tried to reclaim the glory, real or or supposed, you know, imagine mm -hmm. glories of the Persian past. So that wasn't really Islamic, I suppose, right? Right, right, right. I mean, you know, that that's... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, in any kind of claiming of the past, I mean, look at this country, you know, <laughs> everyone. Make America everyone great trying, again. No, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> isn't that isn't that the thing? You know, they, they're trying to reclaim the past um, and uh, listen to the Republican presidential candidate who can't say slavery. You know, this is this is <laughs> this is about reclaiming the past in a sanitized version, you know, and um uh, and uh, of course, you know, uh, the Shah of Iran wanted to reclaim that past and, and create a sense of continuity, civilizational continuity for the past glories of, of the Persian Empire. <clears throat> and, and why is he doing that? Some of it is for consumption, uh, domestic consumption. Yeah. Some of it is to show the uh, great powers of the world that you can't mess with us, you know. <laughs> Although, you know, he was an ally of the U.S., but at the same time, he wanted to sort of say and demonstrate that uh, we are not any kind of puppet government in the world. We inherited a great civilization, and, and you need to come to terms with how great we are. And this is our glorious past. You know? Now, we... we... For the past few minutes, you and I have been talking about greatness and reclaiming uh -huh. real and imagined glories of the past. I get uh -huh. that. But here's something else. Um, I, I, I just know one example, so uh, mm. uh, I'll share that with you. There's also this, in the Middle East, this look at historical victimhood. And I go back mm -hmm. again to the example that I know well from Iran and mm -hmm. Shiite Muslims uh, observe every year uh, the martyrdom of uh, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Hussein. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And you have two days that is called Ashura Taswa. It's on a lunar calendar and it happens mm -hmm. a different day every year. And there's, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of mourning, even though he died 1400 years ago. That is not looking back at history for its glory, is it? Mm -hmm. 
No, this is uh, looking back. Uh, uh, that's I'm, I'm glad you brought that example up because uh, I want to take a little detour to Shariati from there mm-hmm. that uh, to to make the uh, distinction very clear via this example that you brought up. Oh. If if you if you look at Ashura, uh, which is sort of commemoration, as you said, of martyrdom of Imam Hussein, and um, and for uh, centuries, um, in one way or another, this was a ritual that people go and and reenact the martyrdom of uh, Imam Hussein in Karbala, yeah. in, which is in uh, Iraq, not in Iran. Yeah, yeah, yeah in sixteen eighty six eighty. Uh, end of seventh century, and uh, it was a ritual. People do this, and 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 after a day or so, they all go home, and and you know they said, okay, we we did our share. And so here comes Shariati and says that you know, when you look at Ashura and Karbala, the lesson we learn is not victimhood. The lesson we learn is not to go and participate in some form of performance of mourning. Where you beat yourself uh, and, and you cry. You beat yourself and, and then you know, cry and, and you know, uh, put mud on your head and exactly. you, know, you walk around thirsty and all that. And Shariati says that uh, it's very beautiful, actually, the, the way he uh, talks about it. He said that, you know, and in, in the early revolution, there are all these banners that says... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, every day is Ashura, every place is Karbala. In the uh, 1979 revolution. 79, right. Okay. That was Shariati's message, right? Because Karbala and Ashura. By the way, Karbala is where he died. He was killed. He died, yeah. Okay, that's, was, that's, that's the location. He, he was, okay. Yeah, he was killed in Karbala. And the day is Ashura, the 10th okay. day of uh, month of Muharram. Um, and uh, Shariati says that, you know, he's doing a, an allegorical reading of this and say that uh, <clears throat> every day is Ashura. Ashura did not happen 1400 years ago. Ashura happened yesterday. Because the secret police arrested those revolutionaries, and those revolutionaries are the manifestation of Imam Hussein in our time today. So, one, if I if I may clarify or mm-hmm. seek clarification, by secret police, he's talking about the Shah, the Shah, the Shah, yeah. and right. then the second point that I wanted to make sure I'm so all the revolution. Yeah, all the revolutionaries are Imam Hussein. Are Imam Hussein. So in a way, yeah. he re- oh, in a way he revolutionized revolutionized, revolutionized. the Shia religion. Of course, because and, and that's what he says that he said that you know you turn and that he goes to the clergy, to the clergy and says that you turn the most important revolutionary moment in Shia history into and an occasion of mourning and 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 crying and passivity. You need to revolutionize that moment. You need to say that this, this is symbolically the struggle <clears throat> of uh, the oppressed against the oppressor, and that is true for all history. You know, oh, and wow. uh, you know, really uh, you know, uh, you know he, he was he was trained in a Marxist uh, um, tradition, and uh, you know the uh, if you remember the uh, you don't have to remember this, but because I teach these things, I have to remember <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that uh, the greatest line in the Marxist Communist Manifesto is that all history is the history of class struggle. Yeah, all history yeah, yeah. is the history of class struggle. This is Ali Shariati is saying that every day is Ashura, every, every place. place is Karma. This because this is the struggle of the oppressed against oppressor. Right. That so, is fascinating. Um, so this is 
Yeah. What, you know, I, I want to bring some familiarity about, uh, uh, along what we're talking about, both to myself and also to our audience. And I'll use this example. You tell me mm -hmm. if, if this makes sense. <clears throat> You know, let's let's just move away from the Middle East for a moment. Even in 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 Western uh, countries, you know, after World War II, you see more and more the, the French talk about the grandeur of of the French Empire and and the glory of even in the West, uh, history mm -hmm. is used to some extent that way, right? Right. 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 Okay. Well, that's a, that's a, you know the I, at the beginning. Uh, Yesterday we talked about this. That that I said that history is basically a post enlightenment thing, and I said that you know this idea of progress. But the other thing that was very important is the emergence of the nation states, right? And uh, so how how do we understand history without connecting the present time to our glorious past? Like the state of Italy, for example, I give mm -hmm. you this example. <clears throat> Italy was unified in 1864, from 61 to 64. Okay. And uh, and uh, Garibaldi, who was one of the sort of uh, revolutionaries at the time, yeah, uh, said that uh, we have created Italy because he unified the entire. Now time has come to create Italians. Huh. Think about how bizarre this statement is. Right? Because, and how do they do that? By actually creating this sort of glorious history to, to tell people who live in that region, we all share something with one another. Right. And, oh, wow. you know, Italy, Italy of the second half of 19th century had absolutely nothing whatsoever with Roman Empire. <laughs> right? But this is created. This is that becomes the glorified past of Italy. At the time that Italy was unified, only 2.5 percent of Italians spoke Italian. Sorry, did you 2. say 2.5%? 2.5%. You know? That is unbelievable. So, Talk about creating people. Italy. <laughs> Talk about creating cre the oh. Italians, you know? So, like, Sicilians, when, when they sent from Rome, they sent their teachers to Sicily to establish new kind of education, you know, schools. And Sicilians were fighting with them tooth and nail. And then after they defeated Sicilians, and they said, why are you fighting these people? They said, oh, we thought they were the Brits attacking us. Oh, my you know? goodness. That is and so interesting. It, 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 it's so, you know, France, the same thing. I know you, you create these kinds of uh, ma manufactured stories to, I mean, Persian Empire, the same thing, you know. Yeah. Egyptians, the same thing. I mean. The, the Egypt of pharaohs and, and uh, Egypt, the country of Egypt today, really had nothing in common. You know, this is completely, it just happens that it happens at the same region. Same but, ge geographic but, region. You know, what, you're, what you were sharing with me about Italy, and that, that's a wonderful example. France had a similar story in which uh, uh, a few percentage of uh, uh, people in France actually spoke French. But if we extrapolate mm -hmm. that to the Middle East, look at Iraq. You have Kurds right. in the north, Sunnis in the middle, Shiites in the south. Mm -hmm. Many of them speak different language. They have Assyrians in there. I don't know all the uh, different uh, yeah. people. So they yeah. or same in <clears throat> Iran. Uh, one of the most sort of intense cases of it in a little space is Lebanon. So many different yeah. uh, right. nations, actually, not just tribes. Yeah. So you do need some sort of yeah. commonality that, that comes from history. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's commonality. I mean, that's that's why I said that, you know, when I told you at the beginning that <laughs> history is written by historians, you know, <laughs> is made by historians because these are historians that they want to 
generate a sense of continuity, a sense of belonging, a sense of glorious past. And uh, otherwise, you know, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, uh, all these things are totally based on arbitrary borders yeah. that were created, you know, in the aftermath of World War I and divided up between French and British empires and then later independent countries, which really, I mean, had absolutely no meaning whatsoever if you exactly, go back yeah. like, to like five centuries, you know. Um, in the minute we have left of this segment, before we go to the perspective, I want to share an observation with you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you may have a comment or or, or not. I don't know. Uh, you are a scholar at Princeton University. You've been here for decades. It's, it's not like you're in the Middle East. Uh, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. from everything that I see on TV, I haven't been there for decades either since, you know, uh, but the way we think of the study of history here mm-hmm. in the West and the United States, it's got to be different than the Middle East. It's not like, let's say, mm-hmm. um, well, save for Israel or mm. probably not even in Turkey, Turkey. I don't think mm. a scholar can get up all of a sudden and talk about, uh, you know, write a c- critical biography of mm-hmm. uh, let's say Mr. Ordwan or someone mm. can talk about, mm-hmm. I don't think historians are free to exercise the the science of history the way we are here, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like you can walk into a, I don't know, bookshop in Tehran and pick up whatever history book you want or mm. order it on Amazon, mm. right? It's got to be different. Yeah. Thankfully, there is no Amazon in Tehran. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut this part later. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> if Amazon is sponsoring your program. <laughs> no, no one's. No, no, no. So, um, no, that, but... that, that, that's, that's so true. I mean, the, the, the thing is that... Um, for the most part, uh, my point was that censorship also applies to history. Yeah. Oh, of course, I'm mean, yeah. censorship <laughs> first and foremost applies to history, yeah. and uh, and uh, and uh, the U.S. academic world and university system possibly by far is the most successful model of of uh, higher education and scholarship. And um, I mean, there are there's so many difficulties here, especially now. I don't want to get into that, but uh, but uh, nevertheless, I don't think any other country comes even close to the kind of free exercise of um, scholarly expression uh, that we enjoy here in the U.S. Uh, not even in Europe. You know? Not even in Europe. And, uh, not even in Europe, hmm. and uh, and that's because of the way university system is uh, organized in the U.S. Of course, you know history is perhaps one of the most contested areas of of uh, uh, academic uh, inquiry, and uh, because it's and all this conversation we've been having, it tells you how important history is yeah. because. Uh, because it really defines the uh, constitutive elements of a nation. And uh, that- Wait, constitutive... let me say that again. It defines the constitutive elements of a nation. That's really profound. Yeah. Of course it is, because it, because it is. You know? yeah. Because uh, how else do you understand uh, this world uh, from the standpoint of your national belonging, you know, because you have, everyone has a sense of national belonging uh, because this is the way the world is organized. Yeah. And, uh, and in each little part of this world, uh, there are huge industries and machines at work to define that sense of belonging. You know, look at the America we live in now. This is, I mean, this is the struggle of, of writing a history, a sense of belonging that is so contested today. 
I, I want to talk about that, yeah. and let's do that in the next segment. Yeah. Let's take a break here. Stay with me and Dr. Ramari Tabrizi as we get mm-hmm. into the perspective. 